morning and a happy Sabbath to everyone that is present here today. Good morning to our viewers that are watching um, our presentation this morning. And uh, for the opening of our program, I would like to read from Luke 17, verse 22. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And if we go back a little over 2,000 years ago, we remember that Christ was on earth and he was with his disciples for a little over three years. They spent all this time together and Jesus was trying to teach them. And you know what's interesting? That while they were still with Jesus, while they were still every day at his feet, they were not prepared. They were not ready for what was coming up. And we know that when Christ died on the cross and was taken to the courts of those days, everybody fled. Everybody disappeared. So now at the resurrection, there was nobody to actually welcome and uh, be happy with Jesus for the fulfillment of the prophecy. And for that reason, I want to share with you a statement from uh, Desire of Ages, page, page 506. Some of the Pharisees had come to Jesus demanding when the kingdom of God should come. More than three years had passed since John the Baptist gave the message that like a trumpet call had sounded through the land. Matthew 3, 2, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as yet, the, these Pharisees saw no indication of the establishment of the kingdom. And listen to this. Many of those who rejected John and at every step had opposed Jesus were insinuating that his mission had failed. And uh, we probably hear today people saying uh, similar words. When is the coming of the kingdom of God? When is Jesus Christ going to come a second time? And the same people who rejected John, they are the same people that rejected Jesus when he actually came. And uh, we read Luke 17, 22, but let's read two verses ahead. Luke 17, verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. And verse 21 and 22, Neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. So Jesus was with them, among them, when he said those words. Did they understand those words? Were they prepared to witness the fulfillment of them? What's, let's read from the Desire of Ages and find out the answer to that. Because it is not attended by worldly pomp, you are in danger of failing to discern the glory of his mission, of my mission. You do not realize how great is your present privilege in having among you, though veiled in humanity, him who is the life and the light of men. The days will come when you will look back with longing upon the opportunities you now enjoy to walk and talk with the Son of God. And that's why when I mention about the statement of the president, I knew the topic I'm going to present, this statement came into my mind, that now we are enjoying the freedom, we are enjoying the opportunities we have to come and worship together. Should later on look with longing to those days, or we should look and uh, take advantage of them today as we are going through? Because of their selfishness and earthliness, even the disciple of Jesus could not comprehend the spiritual glory which he sought to reveal unto them. And remember, this was while Jesus was with them. It was not until after Christ's ascension to his Father 
and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the believers, that the disciples fully appreciated the Savior's character and mission. After they had received the baptism of the Spirit, then they began to realize that they had been in the very presence of the Lord of glory. Isn't that amazing? They spent three and a half years with Jesus. He resurrected, he ascended to heaven, and now they realize, hold on, that was Jesus that we were walking every day with. That was the promised Messiah, and that was the one that spoke with us every day. And let's keep this in mind because as I'm going into the study, it will connect to what we're going to present. As the sayings of Christ were brought to their remembrance, their minds were open to comprehend the prophecies. So did they understand the prophecies while Jesus were, was telling them? No. They were asking questions and still not understanding the answers to those questions. And continue, and to understand the miracles which he had wrought. The wonders of his life passed before them, and they were as men awakened from a dream. Now, I'm sure you all had some dreams in which you probably just wanted to awake and not go back there anymore because it was probably scary and uh, intimidating. Or you had a dream where you didn't want to wake up from. Now, these disciples, all of a sudden, they realize that that was a dream or was it a reality? They, they're thinking of that. And, uh, you know, sometimes we pinch ourselves. Is, am I dreaming or is this reality? These people, they came to their senses after Jesus ascended and they felt like it was a dream they woke up from. The disciple now seemed to themselves of much less importance than before they realized this. They never wearied of rehearsing his words and works. His lessons, which they had but dimly understood, now came to them as a fresh revelation. The, the scriptures became to them a new book. And uh, I'm thinking today how much access we have to Bible, to spirit of prophecies, to anything that is out there to uplift us. Do we think that, you know, this will uh, sometimes probably not be available? The disciples, it says, they never worried of rehearsing his words and works. Jesus was with them every day, was telling them, encouraging them, and he didn't record with them. Now, when he wasn't there anymore, they said, hold on. These are the words that were prophesied. These are the words that are fulfilled. And these are the words that are in the scriptures. They needed the help of him whom kings, prophets, and righteous men had foretold. Hold on. Weren't they just with Jesus for, for three and a half years? And now they needed his help when he wasn't there anymore? With amazement, they read and reread the prophetic delineations of his character and work. How dimly had they comprehended the prophetic scriptures? How slow they had been in taking in the great truths which testified of Christ. And they started to long for those days for the words that were spoken directly with him, uh, by, by Jesus to them. How eager they were to know it all. They grieved that their faith had been so feeble, that their ideas had been so wide of mark, that they had so failed of comprehending the reality. So I wanted to take these few minutes in the beginning to kind of uh, introduce the topic, because we know that we are living in a time where we don't have Jesus physically present with us, but we have his words. And we have the Bibles, we have the spirit of prophecy, we have so many sermons online. Now, for the past two months, something amazing happened. Our local channel, Carolden 
Carrollton SDRM, where all the online uh, sermons and presentations were broadcasted live, just exploded with subscribers. From probably 50 subscribers that we had for a long time, we are over 2,000 people that want to hear every time that something new is posted. And not only that, the videos that are presented by some of the pastors are viewed by tens of thousands of people, 20,000, 30,000 of people. And uh, we can say that we have Jesus present with us through all these means. Now, let's not get to the point as the disciples were where we should just long for those days and say, I wish I would have listened, I wish I would have read, because now is the day of salvation. Now is the time that we can make those choices. And for those reasons, the topic of the day, the coming of the kingdom of God and the Sunday law are of very importance. Because if we know the events leading to the second coming of Christ, we will not look back and say, I wish I would have done this or I wish I would have done that. And uh, are we identifying ourselves with the disciples? I think we are in so many ways. Are we longing for Christ and for the words that he's ready to share with us? Are we ready to have the prophecies unlocked, unlocked and revealed to us? Now, is Sunday law a reality? What do you all think? I think it is the reality we're living in. It's not happening yet, but as we go through this study, we'll learn there are steps taking towards that to happen. And if we go back in the history, I'm sure you all heard about Sunday blue laws. Uh, it goes way back in the 1600s and 1700s. And for, uh, for example, in the state of Virginia, it was the first Sunday blue law given. In 1617, the Puritans, the ones that came to America, they actually had some very strict laws, and uh, those were called Sunday blue laws. In Virginia, it was required church attendance and authorized militia to force colonists to attend church services. Other blue laws prohibited work, travel, activities such as cooking, shaving, cutting hair, wearing of precious metals, sweeping, making beds, and kissing. All these, they were prohibited in the early history of this country. And um, there is an example uh, in her book, uh, there is an author, Alice Earle, The Sabbath in Puritan England, which Sabbath refers to the Sunday. That's what she meant. In 1656, this, um, this captain, Captain Thomas Campbell, he was gone for three years. Uh, he was a captain on, uh, on the seas, and uh, he came back to his family, but it happened that he came back on a Sunday. And because he kissed his wife on the step doors of his house. He was seen and he was um, sent to uh, public uh, punishment. And he spent two hours in those public stocks. His hands and his head, and he was in the market and people could just come and poke him, spit at him, throw rocks at him because he was a commandment breaker. He was breaking the Sunday and the way it was enforced. Moving on, on uh, Vermont, the same author in the book says, whoever was guilty of any rude, profane, or unlawful conduct on the Lord's day, or in a Sunday as it was uh, back then, in words or action by glamorous discourses or shouting, screaming, running, dancing, or jumping, was to be fined $40 or was whipped on the back not to exceed 10 stripes. So that was in America, in the very early history of this country. And the same, it was in a New Heaven uh, where they had the same conduct where they were punishing uh, people. 
And we know that based on the comments that we have from uh, testimonies, volume seven, I just wanna go back to that slide. The substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. He will arise in his majesty to shake terribly the earth. He will come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity. And the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Volume 7, page 141. Now, there are some steps, there are some stages for the final crisis. And uh, let's read Matthew 24, verses 6 through 8. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And as we read, we understand there are some stages. There is a progression to the fulfillment. And uh, the first stage that I'm identifying are the natural disasters. Now, will these natural disasters bring about a Sunday law? Well, let's continue and uh, read what it's uh, mentioned in Great Controversy. In accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempest, floods, cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. Let me just ask you a question. Have you seen recently in the news how they are talking about the same very thing, famine and distress, why is it so? Well, uh, all this COVID-19, all this virus brought about a big calamity about uh, the whole world, not only just the country, not just the continent, the whole world. And now people are concerned there will be shortages because people did not work, they could not harvest, they could not uh, do their normal activities, and there is a lot to follow. Now, let's just uh, pause for a second. This book, Great Controversy, was written over 100 years ago. However, God inspired the author to help us see what is coming up. And are we seeing this happening today? I think we can all agree. And he goes on in the same book, page 589. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. The earth mourned and faded away. The haughty people do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Are we seeing that happening today? Without even talking about Sunday law, are we seeing frequent and more terrible destruction? I think this is the most, uh, uh, the biggest catastrophe that we witnessed in our generation, what just happened for the past two months. And we know that destruction and greater destruction will follow. And then, the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge 
all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. They will not like the class of people. They are worshiping the right way. They are praising the God in the right day. And they will say, they are provoking God's displeasure. Let's do something about this. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. So here it comes. That this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. This book was written how long ago? Over a hundred years ago. Are we now witnessing what is being written in this book? And it goes on. And that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for a Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. And I wanted to share this whole paragraphs, paragraphs with you because this is the inspired word. It's not something I'm coming up with. Now, we said that the first stage was natural disasters. And as we continue in the study, we'll learn about another stage. These natural disasters are bringing a group of people together against the Sabbath keepers. And uh, stage number two, it's the ecumenism. Or as we also know it, the threefold union. It is a threefold union among who? the Protestants, the spiritualism, and the Romanism. And this picture, it, it's quite old now. It was taken in 2014 or 2015 when uh, the Protestants, the leaders of the Protestant churches in America were invited to Vatican and they all joined. Let's read this prophecy happening these days. The same book. Great Controversy, page 588. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And we saw the picture. And under the influence of this Threefold union, this country, which is America, will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Is this already happening? This reaching of hands across the Gulf. It's happening for many years already. Uh, this tongue uh, speaking, casting out, out devils, spiritualism. This threefold union, it is in progress doing its work. So now we said stage number one was natural disasters. Stage number two, ecumenism or the threefold union. Let's move on to stage number three, agitation of the Sunday law. So we know that there will be a Sunday law. However, before the law, it's being given, there will be an agitation, there will be a tumult about this. And uh, in the Review and Herald, November 10, and look at the year, 1885, there is a strange abandonment of principle. The standard of morality is lowered, and the earth is fast becoming a Sodom. The Sodomitish practices, which brought the judgment of God upon the world, and caused it to be deluged with water, and which caused Sodom to be destroyed by fire, are fast increasing. Fast forward, we are in 2020, over 130 years ago, this statement was made. And uh, you know how this is fulfilled? You know what happened in uh, June 26, 2015? The US Supreme Court, with uh, five votes in favor and four votes against, they made a decision on the 14th Amendment that requires now all states in the union to grant same-sex marriage 
privileges and to recognize them all throughout the states. And what was in this statement? The same principles, the same reasons that brought Sodom to destruction are happening now and are fast increasing. And, uh, you know, let's just think. Did this law was given right away, the same-sex marriage? No. There was an agitation first. There was a lot of people helping, promoting. There was a lot of lawsuits back and forth until it reached where? The Supreme Court, the highest court in the country. And the highest court in the country with uh, nine people in uh, their assembly decided five against four to promote this law. So now there is a law. In uh, the same book, Ravion Herald, November 10, 1885, it says, we are nearing what? The end. God has borne long with the perversity of mankind, but their punishment is no less certain. Let those who profess to be the light of the world depart from all iniquity. And as we look back in the Garden of Eden, there were two institutions given. Do you know which? The institution of marriage came first and the institution of Sabbath. And we see now they are both under attack. We see now that Satan is fighting very hard to put those two under his control. Let's read another paragraph, which is found in uh, Signs of the Times, February 28, 1884. There were two institutions founded in Eden, as we mentioned, that were not lost in the fall, the Sabbath and the marriage relation. These were carried by men beyond the gates of paradise. He who loves and observes the Sabbath and maintains the purity of the marriage institution thereby proves himself the friend of men and the friend of God. Now, he who by precept or example lessens the obligation of this sacred institution is the enemy of both God and man and is using his influence and his God-given talents to bring in a state of confusion and moral corruption. Isn't this amazing? Two institutions were carried out of the garden. And uh, who walked by uh, Adam's side? Eve. It was not Steve. So because God allowed this marriage between men and women, he carried past the Garden of Eden. Now, is this happening in America? We mentioned it does happen. We know that marriage came first, and marriage was first destroyed in 2015 by the Supreme Court. We know that Sabbath came second as an institution in the Garden of Eden. And what will happen next? Sabbath will be destroyed. We are not there yet, but as we see how these words are fulfilling, we'll get there. As there was an agitation about the same-sex marriages, there will be an agitation about the Sabbath keeping. Great Controversy 605. Heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. That's us today, probably. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, have been pronounced what? Groundless and absurd. Go out there and talk to people and tell them that in America there will be a time when you'll not have those privileges that we enjoy it now. What would they say? False alarmists. This is America. This was founded on the principles of the Bible, the principles of freedom. And uh, they're pronounced groundless and absurd. And he goes on. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it is and what it has been. The defender of what? Religious freedom. Isn't this amazing? 
But as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, and the third message will produce an effect which it could not have been or had before. I want to share with you a statement from um, the official Catholic online website. In uh, July 6, 2014, never on Sunday, there was an article. And it says, and I'm um, quoting from there, working on Sunday has a negative effect on families. The full commercialization of Sunday from business being open to people working to what is biblically a day of rest, has Pope Francis in lamentation. The abandoning of the Christian practice of not working on Sundays has a negative impact on families and friendship. And uh, we know that Pope is actually using this context, taking advantage of the natural disasters to promote his agenda. And what's his uh, agenda? Climate change, uniting the families, offering them a day of rest, and finally coming with the Sunday law. In the same article, a short statement says, maybe it's time to ask ourselves if working on Sunday is true freedom. Work is important, so is rest. Shouldn't we learn to respect times of rest, especially Sunday? And this is also written six years ago. And we know Revelation 13, we've been going over. Revelation 14, we've been studying in, in our church. And uh, there are so many studies and uh, materials out there. It's talking about restoring the power and allowing the Catholic Church to lead the world. Let's review. Stage number one was natural disasters. Stage number two, ecumenism. Stage number three was the agitation of the Sunday law. And this will bring about the next stage, the loud cry. Let's read uh, from uh, this uh, paragraph here. The third angel's message is to lighten the earth with its glory. But only those who have withstood temptation in the strength of the mighty one will be permitted to act a part in proclaiming it when it shall have swelled in the loud cry. Now the loud cry begins after Sunday law is being agitated. We know that right now it's not worldwidely agitated. So uh, we are in this time in which we have a chance to prepare so we can be the ones giving the loud cry. And uh, we have to develop something before we have this chance of giving the loud cry. And you know what that is? We have to perfect our characters. It is something that I so wish for myself and I so wish for each one present here and each one that is desiring to be among those giving the loud cry. We are sinners. We fail. Every day we fail. However, if we want to be victorious and give the loud cry, we have to now prepare for the time that it's coming. Now is the perfect time to prepare our characters. Let's read together Matthew 25, verse 6. Matthew 25, verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. We know there were ter ten virgins there. And uh, how many slept? Oh. All of them, all ten of them slept. How many woke up? Oh. All of them woke up. How many were they ready? Only five of them were ready. Now, while the Sunday law is agitated, the Seventh-day Adventists, they have to awake because we know that is the time when all these events are going to happen. And we know that the wise 
people will be the ones giving the loud cry. And the foolish people will be doing what? Will start seeking for their religious experience they're putting aside for so long. Is that the time to do that? It is too late. And uh, they're going to be seeking and knocking at doors that will be closed. And let me ask you this. What qualifies us to be among those giving the loud cry? And we're going back to the disciples because that's what I want to blend all this context so we can relate to them. Desire of Ages 506. The disciples now seem to themselves of much less importance than before they realized this. They never wearied of rehearsing his words and works. His lessons, which they had but dimly understood, now came to them as a fresh revelation. The scriptures became to them a new book. Up until we don't see ourselves less important, up until we don't realize, like the disciples, that I'm not the one, that I'm always right, and I'm always in a position to win, we are not ready to give this loud cry. And it goes on in the same book, page 607. As the time comes for it to be given with greatest power, the Lord will work through humble instruments. You cannot become humble overnight. It is a work that has to be happening. Leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service, the laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observance of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. By these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. And if we are afraid to preach this message now, do you think we're going to have power to preach this message when all these laws will be enforced? I don't think so. And it goes on and it says on page 607, the power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. And uh, when I read that statement, superhuman efforts, what do you think the Pharisees were doing in Jesus' time? They were doing their superhuman best efforts to shut him down. They're looking for occasion at every corner to find him at fault with anything so they can condemn him. Do you think that they will do any less to us if they did that to Jesus himself? And uh, another paragraph. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power. And in this work, Papist and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. So we see there is a progression. For everything that is happening, there is a progression. Now, right now, the Sunday law, it's not given. Right now, the Sunday law, it's not even wildly agitated. Now is the time to do what? To seek the Lord and develop glorious characters that we can be the ones giving the loud cry. As a final review, what did we say? Stage number one, natural disasters. Stage number two, ecumenism or the threefold union. Stage number three, agitation of the Sunday law. Stage number four, the loud cry. And uh, the final stage, stage number five is the Sunday law. And when that will be given, 
that will prove all this time that we read these words that history and prophecy are being fulfilled. And now it is the time to prepare, not when the Sunday law is given. Now is the time to confess our sins, to perfect our characters in fear of God. How much time we have left? Well, let's not look at the clock probably because it's nearing to the end. But how much time do we really have left? Are we closing the history of this earth? Are we seeing events leading that way? And I know that God is not short of fulfilling his prophecies. And uh, as uh, the disciples realized once he ascended to heaven that it was Christ himself among them, shall we wait so late to realize that now is the time that we can actually use all these tools and all these materials and the uh, studies that we have? Now is the time to build our victorious characters. And in conclusion, I want to read Romans 13, verses 11 through 13. And they read the followers. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. I would like to be the one giving the loud cry and I would like each one of us here to be prepared to give that loud cry you know what it takes? It takes victory over sin. And I know I am a sinner. And I know that there is so much more that I have to improve. And I ask you to help me. I ask each one of us to help each other. And I ask God to inspire us to confess sins to him. The law, the Sunday law, it's not passed yet. And uh, we know that we are living in a crisis. And these crises are only getting bigger. We have a great proof. We are living through the biggest crisis of our generation. The test will come for each one individually. The question is, do we have oil in the lamp? Are, do, are we among those five wise virgins? But there is hope for us. There is hope for each one. There is hope for the victory that only Christ and God can give. And this is my wish and prayer for each one of us today. There is hope in Christ. Amen.